Well, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here today because as we prepared for this session, this tasting, um, my excitement just grew by leaps and bounds. When you speak of a vintage uh, in the world of fine wine, uh, you have to go quite far back in the growing season itself and sort of dissect all the, the critical factors that lead eventually to the wine in the glass. So here's a quick synopsis just to underline some of the salient points about these vintages, divided in left and right bank for both, for both years. Okay, left bank 2009. Exceptional ripeness, yes, indeed, and Cabernet, Cabernet, certainly above all, uh, ripened magnificently, and there was a ripeness of the phenolics of the grape that was extraordinary on the left bank in 2009, and even, yes, even the seeds themselves attained an almost unheard of degree of maturity. So there were many more sun hours than many great years, including 47 and 61. The right bank very much mirrored the left. Merlot, extraordinary high levels of maturity with sugars, sugars in the fruit, exceeding, going beyond some other great vintages. Acidities, on the other hand, particularly in Merlot on the right bank, were very, very low, indeed so low that they were at the level of, of that vintage often decried the heat wave 2003s. Then if we look at 2010, what are we going to find? Well, certain key elements, again, like 2009, a beautiful growing season very low rainfall, which we're going to take a look at more closely. Highly concentrated wines. All right, on the left bank in 2010, with strong, assertive tannins. I'm curious myself to see how much of those early tannins remain in the wines. I suspect quite a bit, because this 10 is a long, long keeping year. And low pH abnormally low pH. So what would that mean? pH is a measure of the strength of the acidity. A knife has a blade, it will cut, but the pH is a definition of the sharpness of the blade. So very low pHs that are almost never seen in 2010. So imagine the high sugars and the, the backbone, the definition of the wines, all right? And then on the right bank, Yes, once again, a beautiful season. Grapes were small with greater anthocyanin content, coloring matter, than 09 even, or that other great vintage that we'll touch on further on, 2005. Okay, you ready for some quick graphs? Here we have three vintages, the two that we're going to examine today, plus 2005. And they're compared to the 30 year average. So August, September, October, clearly, as you well know, these are critical months, especially the first two, for the ripening of the grapes in October, especially, let's say, in the duck, critical for the final harvesting. The average level is the far right bar, the purple one. So if you look at the averages here, uh, what do we find? We find that Generally, September was the month, which was so perfect for ripening the fruit, where average sun hours were at a higher level. October as well, for harvest, was beautifully sunny. Then if we look at the alter ego of sunshine, rainfall, here we have the same three vintages compared to the 30-year average we see a somewhat different picture. You see we have July, August, and September once more, and the average is the purple bar on the far right under each. So if we look at the averages here, what do we find in terms of rainfall? Well, it's very plain to see, I think. How low in July, August, September, and October, with the exception of October 2000. 
10 when rainfall reached what would be considered a 30-year average. Then slightly different, let's imagine we have all the vintages in the period 2001 to 2010 and we're going to rank them according to the rainfall. Here are the three that we've looked at just now. Where do you find them positioned on this graph? Well, yes, on the far left. You see where the average is? Right here, extremely dry compared to the norm. All three vintages, especially 2010. Now you might wonder because I just showed you October 2010 at a higher level, but this is July to September. Okay, it's all how you present the information, isn't it? Ah, this is a fantastic way of depicting vintages. Plot them, plot them on the vertical axis, average annual temperatures, this is in Celsius, of course, on the horizontal, total rainfall, and now it's March to October. So really the full growing season. So here are our two vintages on the left-hand side of our plotting, all right, 2009 and 2010. Moving from left to right across the graph, we go from drier to wetter. And if we're moving vertically from bottom to top, from cooler to hotter. Generally speaking, the top vintages of these decades are in the drier and warmer quadrants, aren't they? So how are we going about this today? For the first three pairs, I have told you, I have told you what the appellation of origin is, right? You can see it. Yes. Now, you don't know in those pairs or any of the pairs which is the 2009 and which is the 2010. Then, the second set, the back half of our tasting, I have not told you what the appellation of origin is. And in addition, of course, you don't know which is the 9 or the 10. We're going to do it pair by pair. We're going to deconstruct this. And when you leave this room, you are going to be masters of Bordeaux vintages. OK, are we ready? So have at it, the first pair. Are they from the same producer? Yes, same chateau, each pair. OK, so it's a fair comparison. Would you have believed if I hadn't told you that this was Santimino? The power, the tannic frame, maybe more in one than the other. My goodness. These are wines for, as they say, the ages, okay? And we'll see if it holds, whether both years, 10 and 9, are equally undeveloped here in 2019, or is one vintage or another beginning to soften. Is there one that seems to have more prominent what acidity than, than the other? And if so, which of the two would that be? Is it number one? Well, that's gonna, we're going to be almost equally divided here, aren't we? <laughs> and, and so the other, everyone else believes it's number two has the more prominent acidity. That's, it's 55-45 according to my guesstimate here. Acidity and tannin reinforce each other to create greater intensity, harshness on your palate. Alcohol, especially when it reaches a fairly high level, magnifies that further. And I'm finding these are already just attacking my palate. Both vintages, regardless of what they may be, both vintages are so far from their better drinking period, both. And I don't know if you followed Canon. I have because I, I love the style of this chateau, but could we say that this is a little out of keeping with the subtlety and delicacy that you would normally find in a Canon? Yes, I, I think we can. So the vintages, both vintages, are speaking very loudly here, and I do believe that's going to prevail in our tasting here today because very ripe years overwhelm their terroir and represent a departure from the average. No? So would you like to see what the vintages are? Yes, please. You would? Yes. Really, Jeannie? 
All right. Glass number one, 2010. Glass number two, 2009. So some had it right and some didn't. But to me, the marker, the marker was the acidity, which was more prominent on my palate in the glass one. That was the, when you discard everything else, process of elimination, you come back to that acidity in the final taste, which says 2010 because of the acidity and the lower pHs. All right, so let's go into the second pair. We're in Pesac Leño, often understated in the red wines, understated, more about subtlety and finesse. And yet, we have, uh, as the French might say, two wines that are almost costaud, you know, they're a little brutish right now. These are powerful wines for Pesac Leño. They're keepers. I would let the structural components guide you. You might be off, maybe there's a twist in the, in, the, in the expression of the vintages for a given chateau, but generally I would look for the structure. Let the structure tell you which is the 2010. Ten. The more assertive truck structure, both tannin and acidity together would lead you to 10. But you also have a nine, we already discovered it, sometimes quite firm, dry tannins, but you don't have the acidity. You have the tannin, but not the acidity. That's nine. Which one has, which one has a marginally younger color with more purple in it? You are correct, sir. Y the younger color, another indication, kind of pushing you in that it's the younger of the two vintages. And the structure of the wine, the structure of wine says 2010. Ten is a classic long-term year, the sort of vintage that is fabled. They're, they're lost to time in a sense. There, there are vintages that are tasted at 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 years of life. That's what ten is. That's what ten is. Yes? With Bordeaux, I have a hard time distinguishing between acidity and tannin. Think lemon juice. That's citric acid, so that's even more intense. But if you want a common taste, I'd go to lemon juice. That sharpness on your tongue. Whereas tannin, right, you were struggling with defining or distinguishing. Tannin is a, a, a black tea brewed too strong. And so now we're moving into the Medoc, aren't we? One second, there's a question here. Again, it's a really good one um, because it touches on how long are wines aged in Bordeaux in barrel? That's the fundamental question. And is there sort of a, a fixed number of months in, in, in Barrique? And the answer is no, because Bordeaux and all French appellations are hyper-regulated, hyper-regulated, down to extremely fine points, certainly in the vineyard and extending into the cellar. But one thing that's not dictated is how long or if you should keep your wine in barrel. So that's an individual, just the artist's license to interpret their wines and to produce a result that they find meets their stylistic objective. Aren't there markers here between these two? And so what would you say? Uh, uh, I've been following the tannins uh, so far. And? And number six has much more tannins to me than- More than structure. Yes. And does that include acidity? Yes. More tannin and acidity in glass number six. Okay. So let's keep going here. All right, are we ready? Okay. Have you followed the history of Lascombe? Because it's been bought and sold and bought and sold. It's in the hands of a French insurance company. Ah, aren't so many. La Mutuelle just changed hands this decade, early, it was 2011. And, and uh, so it's, it's kind of, I think, struggled with defining its new style, its modern style. Uh, some vintages in this last decade or so, I have found too big, too rich in fruit, not really Bordeaux, and way too much oak for my taste. New oak, new oak. 
I love the 09. Look at that incredible fruit that's coming out of the nose there. Beautiful, love it. Beautiful. Mmm, boy. See, now that wine, decant it with a nice piece of rare red meat with a, a good, very flavorful meat reduction sauce. You could do it. There are plenty of tannin in the background of the 09. It's there on your palate, yes, you can't get away from that. You'll have to wait, but if you want to drink it now, there's so much beautiful upfront fruit that does coat at least my tongue. Now, which noble appellations in Bordeaux remain? Poyac. What else? Saint Julien. What else? Saint Estephe. What else? Pomerol. You have your menu, ladies and gentlemen. There we go. All right, so let's go into this next pair now, namely wines seven and eight. I think we have another model in the same line as our previous wines. One is nearly, and I underline nearly approachable, drinkable now, nearly, although it has a lot of tannin in the background, the first of the pair. The other has real, it's compact, it's more narrowly focused with a quite rigid frame, backbone but an amazing length of, of fruit that's compacted, that's hidden within, that's just on my palate, just goes on and on and on and on. Super, really good. Let's, let's see if we can get to the appellation of origin, shall we? Are we on the right bank in Pomerol? We've already identified it as one of the possibilities here. All right, we're in left bank, yes sir. We are in left bank. You think it's a Saint-Julien, so you're in that camp, and there's so much commonality between Saint-Julien and Pouillon, so many ways, depending on the chateau. Or is it, is it further north? Is it, uh, is it saint Estef, for example? Wait a minute, all you guys agree that it's saint Estef? saint Estef. Bravo, gentlemen, well done. You too, back there, yeah. Are you surprised that La Font Rocher has risen to this level? Totally. Already now, our last four wines, all right? So the penultimate pair in glasses, nine and 10, nine and 10. Let's look at those. What is, what is the profile of Poyac? Don't rush to judgment. Is this closer to Latour or closer to Lafitte? I think it's a Pichon, so that straddles the two styles in a sense, maybe. maybe we could say. Well, you know, if you, if you read a general wine encyclopedia, they'll make a statement about what Poyac is, but it's not enough. The truth is more complicated, more complex, broadly in the two families of styles I've described, with intermediary. It's the Lafitte style for many reasons. Let's talk terroir first, where it's situated, all right? You're talking about cool, even north-facing in some places. So you, this is a chateau that has risen, I won't say quite from the ashes, but it's been, it's had a long underperforming period until the late 2000s. Maybe 2008 was the demarcation point. You only have two grape varieties. Almost unheard of. It's certainly amongst the classified gross in the Medoc to be working with the, only the two principles, no Cabernet Franc. No Petit Verdot, no splash of Carmenere, right? Okay, shall we go on to our last pair, all right? All right, while you're, while you're mulling over this last pair, let me answer this question, which is in the previous pair. What takes you to Poyac versus saint julien Wow, now we're really getting in, into the, the art of, of tasting because you have to allow for the difference in styles within those appellations, which I've tried to highlight. saint julien may be a bit more uniformity. Let me, let me step out on a limb and say that than Poyac, despite what the textbooks say. They're both with a high percentage of Cabernet Sauvignon at the high levels in the Cru Classé, right? saint julien Poyac. So that complicates it. It doesn't make it simpler. 
a lot of black fruits, a lot of concentration and structure on broad generalizations across vintages in both Sangria and Poyac. Are we on? Have we done these last two wines? Everybody tasted them? Totally. All right, so Levi Bakhto. So let's, let's just say the following. Was this the right, was this the right order? <laughs> if you wanted to do this open, not this blind tasting exercise. If you want to say, okay, Roger, these are the, these are the chateaux I have, these are the vintages. Would you present these three, these last three appellations and these specific wines in the order that I presented them here Absolutely. today? Is a yes here? Absolutely. Well, that's interesting. Vintages, vintages, ladies and gentlemen, are we ready? Yes. All right, reveal, the big reveal. I think it was pretty clear. I say that not because I'm presuming and because I knew, because of the other wines we tried. All right, so there, see the confidence level you have now at the end of this? Robert Parker, I keep using that name because he wrote incredible notes. You might want to go back and do, if you do subscribe, I, I, do, I subscribe to online, e, e. Robert Parker, so I'm always checking things and just to get a viewpoint and to learn because every day is a learning experience. But he, he had glowing notes about the 2010 especially, 2010, this one, Le Bouton. Really? Close to one, close to 100 points, and he said it was one of the greats of all time. And you know what? Here we are, 2019. I'm tasting it, and I agree with him. I agree with him. It's super concentrated, but there's a class and a breed. Now those are not tasting terms. They're impossible to define. But I'm reaching for a way of describing and classifying this particular wine. Super concentrated. The fruit is very mature, but not it's at the border before crossing over into maybe a little too far. And all that incredible fruit that's contained within this 2010 is backed up by this powerful framework of tannin. 50-year wine? I wouldn't doubt it in a really good cellar. I wouldn't doubt it. I'm going to, I think, leave it on that, on that note. And I'm looking forward to dinner with everyone. Thank you.